Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll have Prisons Department. Good morning. Good morning. Council President Clark and members of City Council, I am Blanche Carney, Commissioner of the Philadelphia Department of Prisons. Joining me today to my left is Deputy Commissioner Terrence Clark and to my right, Errol Dika, Financial Officer. I am pleased to provide testimony on the uh, Philadelphia Department of Prisons fiscal year 2020 operating budget. Uh, the, the mission of the Philadelphia Department of Prison provides a secure correctional environment to detain people accused or convicted of illegal acts. And the PDP operates five facilities in the greater Northeast. We also provide programs and services, including job training, educational services, parenting classes, substance abuse services, behavioral therapy, and counseling, individual and group therapy. The plan for fiscal year 2020, the prisons will support the administration's goal of criminal justice reform by continuing to offer programs and services to de design to enable the successful reentry of returned citizens into society. This continuity of care starts while individuals are incarcerated and links them to services and support when they leave the prison system with the ultimate goal of reducing recidivism and decreasing the number of incarcerated individuals in Philadelphia. In further support of the administration's goals, the PDP commissioned as requested a cost efficiency analysis conducted by CGL and the final report of February 2019 concluded the following. The Philadelphia Department of Prisons is a cost-effective user of City of Philadelphia resources within the context of its performance objectives and the constraints under which it must operate. While potential opportunities are available to achieve some savings, the overall PDP budget supports an efficient approach to management of the City's correctional system. PDP spending patterns did not develop in a vacuum. They largely stem from the policies, professional standards, and operational priorities established by department leadership. For example, the specific performance requirement and staffing levels established by the PDP in its medical contract drive both the current level of spending for the program as well as the high quality of services provided. Constraints and obligations created by factors such as the system's current physical plan and current collective bargaining agreements also shape system resource needs. As the PDP was compared to other jurisdictions from around the country, we believe that this was an appropriate assessment of our operations. The proposed funding requests for fiscal year 2020 general funding totals 2,338,183 $523, a decrease of $11,968,714 below fiscal year 2019 estimated obligation levels. This reflects a net decrease of $22.7 million from fiscal year 17 high point in obligations of $260 million. Factoring in wage increases in fiscal year 18, 19 and 20 that offset reductions, a total of 40.1 million in wage increases, along with the House of Correction utility savings to close, excuse me, close to $900,000. The true cost reduction in fiscal year 20 as compared to fiscal year 17 high point exceeds $60 million. So we have uh, been diligent in managing the operations of the Philadelphia Department of Prisons. The same folks um, as indicated and reflected in narrowing, councils narrowing the gap report, those are the same folks that are finding themselves incarcerated at the prisons. Appreciate that. Okay. Okay. You done? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. So, and thank you. Thank you for your service. Um, let me get into some budget issues. So, last year, um, crunch time, i.e. a conclusion of the budget, there was some shifting of revenues based on, and appropriations based on the need to close the school district gap. Um, this was prior to us realizing that we had a, a much higher fund balance than anticipated, and it was a move to take some money from the prisons and, and from council person's perspective was that 
there was a reduction in the population uh, as it moved towards quote unquote close the creek that we thought that it would be prudent uh, if any savings uh, materialized as a result of that reduction, we would put that money uh, in public education, um, i.e. front side versus back side. Um, with that shift, did you experience any difficulties with your ability to run the department as a result of that, from my say, relatively small incremental shift in funding? Was yes, uh, Councilman, we did experience some challenges, but myself and my team managed extremely well under uh, the reduction in the uh, budget in that with the closure of the House of Corrections, we were very methodical in redeploying staff to the five remaining facilities mm -hmm. to fill vacancies. Uh, we've been under staff for a number of years. And we took a step back and said, okay, with the reduction in those fundings, you redeploy staff to fill vacancies. And for the first time uh, under my appointment, we were able to create a unit, uh, our medical transportation unit which is uh, devotedly, strictly to outside open ward details. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, a meaningful way, and we had to reduce posts where we could, and we did reduce posts to create that unit. That has uh, been a major driver of our overtime reduction because it helps to uh, keep as many uh, uniform staff inside the facilities as possible. Okay, so you figured out a way to make we it work. We figured out a way under yeah. the constraints. That That's usually how it works, you know. We we never have enough money in government, but we figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. All right. Um, and I think the contribution to the school district, uh, given recent upticks in test scores, is, is important at the end of the day. We can't fix our public school system, then what's the point? Why are we here? Um, a couple of other budget related. So in your testimony, you project a 9.4 million decrease in overtime. Um, so what, what, what policies are being enacted to ensure a reduction, a further reduction in overtime? Um, and do you believe that this reduction is enough given a con continual decline in the prison population? So there should be, a, from our perspective, and like you're the professionals, we're the lay people in that aspect. But we believe that the, the population declines, then there should be a corresponding reduction in um, expenditures. Can you talk okay. me through that? Yes, I can. Uh, Council President, one of the uh, hallmarks of our, our reallocation and redeployment of staff, and it was recently in the PICA report, and just in for this third quarter, uh, we have reduced overtime spending considerably. And one of the uh, policies that we've implemented is to keep as many uniform staff inside the facilities and closing posts that uh, if they're not in operation for various programs and services, we close those posts and then redeploy staff accordingly. One of the biggest things that we always have to keep in the forefront, it is, this, it is a correctional environment. Mm -hmm. And along with industry standards is to bring inmates out of their cell to be engaged in meaningful activity, both recreational uh, treatment, behavioral health, substance use, and education. And so when we're able to have as many inmates out, the staff are redeployed accordingly. And that's a major driver of reducing uh, not only the inmates being able to come out, but also having the staff available. And so with the 5% vacancy rate, that's how we're actually managing because that MTU unit, the medical transportation unit, has, mm -hmm. has really taken some of that heavy lift and burden off of the officers that we have to remove from the staff. And that's a major driver. And that's how we've been managing. We've mm -hmm. been very diligent and cost effective in evaluating posts that we can safely uh, close or deactivate if there's no activity. Okay. Thank you. Um, the medical contract, um, I think there's been about 15 years since the last bid on medical contract. Is there any thought about rebidding or is that number incorrect, rebidding on medical contract? Yes, we will issue that uh, contract through an RFP. And I'd just like to share because that's been of a major concern. Uh, when you talk about the numbers and the care, the same folks that are in the Department of Prisons, if you overlay that on the areas uh -huh. that have high poverty rates, they're the same folks. And I'd just like to read, uh, as part of our CGL analysis, 
Uh, as indicated, language from page 28 of the CGL cost efficiency analysis, February 2019 report, mm -hmm. and this reflects the Corizon composition of fees section. Approximately 55% of the annual contract fees relating to physical medical care services are comprised of personnel costs. This is consistent with prior years with the similar contracts and comparable systems. As administrative and corporate fees are fixed, nearly 75% of the contract costs are fixed and not of variable nature. A reduction in the inmate population will not translate into a proportional reduction in either the cost per inmate or overall cost. The MHM contract has a similar structure. Both contracts require payment of incurred expenses only, so that if post, excuse me, so that if positions are not filled, 100% of the consequent savings accrue to the city. On page 29 of the same report, providing quality medical and mental health care is one of the most difficult, challenging challenges facing correctional managers today. While no system is perfect, the PDP developed a sound, sustainable system for delivery of good quality jail care with substantial decreases uh, to the city's potential risk for litigations. Across the, the uh, nation, some of my peers are under uh, litigation because of the poor quality of health care. Mm -hmm. Those folks that we bring in, again, a majority of those conversations, uh, excuse me, um, contracts are for person personnel to deliver and render the care deliver, and sir. we're getting we're receiving people that are underinsured have never uh, been treated or properly diagnosed so when they come in I have a personal responsibility I, I work with human beings I don't deal with numbers and so when we have illness burdens for people with diabetes uh, high blood pressure, sickle cell, dialysis, and behavior health, and substance use, uh, sub substance use, I have to deal with that. And so that keeps me up at night. When people are coming in in poor condition, the onus is on me to ensure that if they did not receive the care for whatever reason, poverty, mm -hmm. underemployment, lack of insurance, when they come to the Philadelphia Department of Prisons, that's the right thing to do. And it is not cheap. And, and the services that we receive, you get what you pay for. And I really try to champion that because I don't want to have a, a, a grade F in health care and behavioral health care because we have some of the highest poverty numbers. Those are the same folks that are inside the department. And they should be better off when they return back to their communities. Mm -hmm. and, and behavior health and medical care are huge drivers of that cost. Okay, great. A refreshing, refreshing approach uh, to dealing with that population, um, not just about the numbers, but yeah. about the total rehabilitation of individuals, um, at which I'm glad you referenced the uh, document, the uh, reducing poverty, closing, narrowing the gap is one of the things that we are focusing on um, is providing uh, family sustaining uh, career opportunities for those individuals that are moving into the, the general population, i.e. Uh, the city's workforce. Um, and it was actually a conversation uh, with one of the labor leaders who recommended that we work on that in the construction trades because we thought that uh, the population might be well suited to be a participant in that. So we're going to be working towards that. Um, the simple reality is, is if we really are we're genuine about the recidivism issue, um, we have to be real about creating those opportunities because unfortunately, uh, too often, um, people aren't given a second or a third chance coming in that population and ultimately people will go back, right? Or end up, unfortunately, in, uh, in a much worse uh, situation. Um, we actually were talking about uh, we just met recently with a, a group of individuals who represent uh, the Apartment Owners Association and the housing, and there were some aspects of it, and actually within some components of the government, where if individuals have records, um, that they're not allowed to get an apartment. Yeah. And the simple reality is if you, know, you don't give a person a place to live, particularly an affordable place to live, the likelihood that they will not uh, have the comprehensive uh, approach to uh, rehabilitating themselves is limited. So we will be um, reaching out to you. We've had a couple of meetings and we laid out our proposal uh, in terms of what we think should happen. Um, actually kind of a block the box proposal where you take a, 
an application for an apartment and you can't ask that person about that uh, at your first opportunity for an application because we know how it was with jobs. You fill that, check the box. Um, if that box is there, you got to tell the truth, but if the box is not there, it might actually get you a second opportunity to have for a further interview. Uh, so similarly, we think that this should be the same thing. And at some point, you know, um, and I actually want to, want to say that the response we got from the, the groups that we've met with were somewhat positive. Uh, they understood the need to be supportive, uh, ensuring that people got affordable places to live. Uh, but they had a couple of issues, like they were concerned about um, issues relating around um, pedophilia, certain certain types of, uh, you know, high profile crimes, but uh, it was not a, not a direct no, we're not interested. So that is positive. So uh, we'll look forward to working with you on that and um, having the ability to have your input in that very, very important uh, process. Um, I wanna recognize Councilwoman Reynolds Brown. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Um, first, let me back up to a question I posed to the police department regarding the partners, the reentry partnerships effort. Are you familiar with that at all? Yes, I am. Can you speak to that and, and where, where that effort is, where it lies, where it sits in government? So Councilwoman, that's a, a, a unified approach for reentry okay. and the uh, newly established Office of Reentry we are currently, uh, there was an RF, an RF, a job announcement placed and uh, interviews are underway uh, to have a director assigned. But stepping back, as part of the Philadelphia Safer Community Initiative in yes. partnership with uh, Commissioner Ross and uh, Deputy Managing uh, Director for Public Safety, uh, Vanessa Garrett Harley yes. and myself, we're all working collectively. And that Office of Reentry now really does put us in a position that uh, for so many years we, we operated in, in silos. silos. That one department was to shoulder all the responsibility. That's not the best approach. Agreed. And so this approach now takes into account uh, engagement across systems yes. and then linking people with resources and services. And I do want to commend uh, City Council for taking that heavy lift as we did with the fair chance hiring. Mm -hmm. Now it's fair chance housing because we know people were marginalized and they were, that was a life sentence. They could never have a safe place to live. Sure. And so what this Office of Reentry will do, it will work at the highest level across all systems, pulling together resources yes. for a unified approach versus the siloed approach. Kudos for, for what's called coordination, when you have multiple systems serving the same individual. And um, even during the street administration, there was a lot of uh, unhappiness with members of council because it was clear that systems were not coordinating while focused on uh, the same family. Yes. And so there's been progress and that's huge. So I commend you and your team for that. Um, I also want to speak to the MWDSBE um, uh, rates and to commend you that you've exceeded, you, you've exceeded goals. So if you have indeed exceeded your goals in the last two years, help us understand why for 20, FY 2020, you've set a goal at 35%. When, you, when you're in the 45%, 46% range. Help me understand. And Councilman, Councilwoman, just to be uh, blatantly honest and transparent, I'm keeping it at the goal of 35. We've been exceeding and is selling. Okay. Uh, and as you've indicated, we've been well above. And I, you, okay, we'll always uh, go over that goal of 35. Okay. That's the only reason why it hasn't changed. Okay. And well, I haven't raised it's, it. It's, it's refreshing to, to see department heads, those who lead major organizations who, 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 who set the goals and then don't come back with excuses, but exceed the goals, which means you have to be intentional because it's not gonna happen organically. It just ain't. Yeah. So hats off to, to you and the members of your team for recognizing that it matters when we put Philadelphians to work because then they can feed their families. Yeah. It's, it's really that simple. Uh, what strategies have you implemented to attract or recruit uh, MWDSBEs, particularly in the area of professional services contracts? 
So we've been working closely with not only using the phila.gov search engine, but really putting uh, our information out into the social media atmosphere. So we're not only relying on phila.gov, but we're using various search engines to announce opportunities. And that's to engage and make sure we're very inclusive. Yes. Because oftentimes, uh, you know, you just get so dug into using one platform. Well, if people don't know how to navigate the city platform, but we can use various search engines to announce it, we're going to attract a diverse candidate pool indeed, of applicants. And, and indeed meet people where they are. Exactly. So I, I would ask that you share that strategy with some of your colleagues at your level, because there are department heads who come here and have excuses for why they have not been able to achieve their, their goals. And I live in, in, and work in a space where excuses are the tools of incompetence, and those who use them build castles to nowhere. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, employment levels, the bell hasn't rung yet. Uh, uh, I understand that there is a 6.4 6 decrease in Class 100 funds, primarily due to the reduction in total employees and overtime. However, in FY19, uh, your department budgeted for 2,300 full-time positions, but only 2,100 were filled as of December of 2018. Uh, just speak to the 167 positions uh, that are not filled and, and maybe the why around that. What impediments are you facing? So, Councilwoman, those positions are, uh, came primarily with the House of Corrections. And so with the closure of the House of Corrections, those are those positions. I see. And so um, once we closed the House of Corrections, uh, those positions went away. And then the staff were redeployed to the five remaining facilities to fill vacancies. I see. Okay, then. Well, uh, you should know that um, some time ago I had a meeting with the mayor, and there's some very redundant questions that I asked in most sittings. And one of them was, how well are we doing with regards to having women in position of leadership and responsibility? You were one of the first names he called. So congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Taubenberger, please. Thank you very much. Commissioner Carney, I just want to say a couple things, more than any other kind of questions. I uh, also reviewed the report of PICA, and you are mentioned there uh, as far as getting uh, overtime in order, managing it well, and I, I appreciate that very much. I also uh, appreciate very much what you're doing with reentry programs. I ran for the city council coming from the world of the Chamber of Commerce. And the fact that a city of our size is the poorest city in America, we need jobs, 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 and more jobs. So I'm very much business supportive, but I'm also very supportive of ways to get people employed. And, and what you're doing at the prisons is, is, a, is, I think, a great thing. And wherever we can even improve that further, please uh, call on me. And uh, I thank you for your leadership in that. I also want to thank you for your leadership in having the prisons involved in the community. I've attended a number of parades uh, where your color guard is prominently featured. Yes. I think that's important to show the community that uh, you're, you're also part of the community and, and you celebrate along with us, particularly certain holidays or ethnic festivals. Yes. And uh, I think it means a lot to everybody. So I thank you very much and uh, that's really all my comment for you. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Jones. Good afternoon. How are you? Welcome back. Uh, my, I, I, all of the accolades that were given just ditto me. Um, I've been up uh, on State Road uh, many times and, and seeing the balance that you have to maintain of being a corrections facility, but also a life preparing facility to entering back into the real world and as a productive member of a community. So I applaud you like they did. A couple of um, questions by way of, give me a sense, there's seven prisons, one was closed, House of Correction. What, what, what is the capital plan for the complex, if you would? And rumor on the street is that we may be getting a CTE facility up there is that factual so one of uh, we have we had 
six major operating facilities with the closure of House of Corrections that leaves us with five major operating facilities. We are sitting on a 25 acre footprint in the greater Northeast. Uh, we have commissioned a space and planning study that I expect to be uh, completed uh, at the end of June of this year and we will have more information. Uh, one of the uh, key points is to make sure that we were thoughtful and diligent in really uh, doing a thorough assessment and that uh, analysis will be published at the end of June and then will be released. Now the rumor, um, it's a lot of rumors and a lot of people are speaking on behalf of the prison but no one has consulted the commissioner. It's very interesting. People are- So you uh, weren't involved in the rumors? Uh, no sir, I, I don't spread rumors, I don't sir. entertain them but I, deal in the, I engage in the facts, <laughs> just the facts. And so that factual report and analysis, I anticipate will be provided at the end of June. And that's really what I want. I know a lot of folks uh, are reimagining what the prisons will be and, and what they hope to be. But I believe as the commissioner, no one's consulted me that I, in my recollection, but I'm certainly open to making and reimagining prisons. And that's uh, coupled with services and resources to better prepare folks for reentry. So it's a, de it's a delicate balance. Yes, it is corrections, but again, we're dealing with human beings and we wanna make sure we have the best thorough assessment. So hypothetically from your professional um, assessment, which I think is better than most of us who might dream, you have the reality of making it so. If you had to think of maybe three CTE programs that could work within an average stay of six to 18 months, I would guess, is your time frame. Which have you given thought, and if it's okay if you haven't, have you given thought to some programs that you'd like to see at the facility that a person who happens to be spending time up there could take advantage of and maybe come away with a useful skill and also a work certificate to obtain? So we've given careful consideration. We do have a CET, a CTE program uh, that was uh, funded by a grant with the School District of Philadelphia. And uh, that's our CTE program. So we've implemented that uh, with the Penny Pack House School. And there's a, a small population at CFCF. So there's room to explore expansion of that program. Also exploring uh, the building trades. So in partnership with JEBS, we, if we have reimagined space, could we then partner with uh, various unions to provide um, that type of construction work? Uh, optics, cable optics is another uh, one that we could, you know, really that I've given thought about how will we deliver that in a correctional environment. I'm sorry. Cable optics or? Fiber cable? optics. Fiber, Fiber optics. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And then there's uh, CDL. And CDL, uh, yes, there's a simulator um, programs out there. They are very costly. But if, you know, during this process where we're getting a thorough assessment, that's my wish list to really reimagine what we could do behind the walls. So on the record, I'm going to ask you to give us those ideas okay. so that I can share it with the other rumor people that might be evolving around you so that at least we know what you want. Thank you, Councilman. what Council you think Man. could work. Now, one that you didn't mention, which many people in this building take advantage of, is the furniture manufacturing yes. piece. My desk, my conference table, my uh, tree for my coats were all made by uh, members that were up in, in on State Road. So is that something you might want to include in that? We can expand certainly with the uh, services that we do provide. It's a valuable resource. It's a great skill set to, to uh, attain while you're there. And that's certainly on the table. Now, I, I, frankly speaking, I took it for granted because I know the great work that they do. I was putting my wish list for the new things, but certainly we can expand that yeah. program. So you also have the um, catering? That yes. You guys do, and I want to put that on the record. All of those skills translate into uh, the uh, reentry world. Yes, sir. Um, that people can get a certificate. You can get a safe serve certificate. You can learn some of the things with cable optics that might get you an entry level job. Yes. When you are released, and so I, I would I would challenge your think tank to come up with maybe no not more than ten because oh. we're not going to do more than ten. Okay. Yeah, but but your top ten. I will. In, 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 um, 
maybe descending water, say if I had one trade that I want to give the mass uh, 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 population, this would be it. And, and if you can do that, we can share that and try to kind of coordinate ideas. Um, by way of capital, we talked about the capital plan, and you haven't gotten that, so you're going to give us that at some date in the future. Yes. Programmatic, as you reduce population, your personnel, are you retraining them with other skills, cause, or are you, through attrition, letting the uh, 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 workforce contract? What, what is your game plan if we're having less inmates? How are you going to retool your staff? I'm glad you asked. So over the, since September of 2018, we implemented crisis intervention training. We were always understaffed and uh, outpaced through the population. So now that the population has been reduced by 43%, it gives us an opportunity to step back and do viable training, not just safety, care, and control, but now doing more thoughtful evidence-based training. Crisis intervention training in a correctional environment looks different in other departments. And so someone not following in order. It's not simply they're not following. Is it that they don't have the cognitive ability? There's some impairment, behavior health, physical health. So I'm, pl I'm pleased to say we have our third co cohort of staff, multidisciplinary team that have been trained in CIT. They receive a pin. Not everyone can uh, respond. And those staff are specifically called to de-escalate and assess the situation, thus reducing uh, use of forces. So I'm going to yield, I'm going to have... There's no one to yield to if you want to continue. Uh, okay. I, I thought you might. That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> oh, I'd start. Okay. So, um, if you say so. <laughs> so, so continue one of them. And so we also have implemented uh, since last year the performance excellence training, which is for every correctional or in multidisciplinary supervisor at the department to do more coaching and use real life scenarios so where we can coach folks for them to gain skill sets, interact better with uh, between labor and management, that's also underway. The, uh, another proud um, piece we're, we're really taking hold of is our MAT program, our medication assisted treatment program. It takes correctional officers in addition to our uh, mental health and physical health care provider to make services run. It's incumbent upon us that as we're rolling out initiatives and new programs that the uniform staff have just as much information as possible because it really is reshaping corrections. It's not punitive. It's very therapeutic coupled with safety and security. And so as we deliver these programs, correctional staff are right alongside. In addition to the medication assisted treatment, we also have our time out of cell program. Across the country, the studies have shown keeping folks in solitary confinement is the wrong thing to do. It's been, uh, you know, learned much too late. And so we're at, at the forefront of that, but also engaging and educating staff why you bring people out of the cell. It's not rewarding them for bad behavior, but it's really giving them the tools now to engage with that population and to help people transition that do pose a viable threat to safety and security of themselves and other inmates. But now it's a different linkage. We're now you're educating and giving the uniform staff the tools that they need to understand. For so long, corrections has been broken up into two cohorts, civilian and uniform. And, and you know, that's an old siloed approach. Now it's a holistic approach. This is why we're doing what we're doing. And that benefit translates into transferable skills beyond the workplace. In our own communities and in our own families, you can use these same skill sets to de-escalate and assess the situation before you go zero to 60 in your response. Yeah, I had to learn that with my kids. <laughs> don't laugh, don't, don't encourage me. Um, so what I would ask, with the population decrease, have we seen corresponding um, stats related to maybe assaults going down or assaults against uh, correction officers going down. So what, what has been the 
unintended consequence of that population decrease? Good morning, Councilman. Good morning. I, I would not say that. I'm sorry, the, did you state your I'm, name for the record earlier? I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah. Terrence Clark, Deputy Please. Commissioner. Thank you. I, I would not say that we've seen a decrease in the incidence as most of the reduction in the population have been um, community custody level uh, individuals who not the, not the ones who actually commit the most of the assaults and against other inmates or correctional officers. We still maintain the most uh, violent individuals still in custody. So th they still have those types of problems. However, as the commissioner did mention, with the uh, CIT training, that's another tool for the correctional officers. And, and it's actually working out pretty good. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna have uses of force because we will still have it. It's not gonna work every single time but it's something that we can, that the staff has, the people who have had the training, they actually enjoy the opportunity to use the CIT training. And they, we kind of have a little blog within the, the prisons where we kind of report out. As I myself have been through the training, um, multiple supervisors um, of the higher level have been through the training because if we just train the correctional officers, and their supervisors don't understand what's going on, the supervisor will walk up and just say pepper spray when they're in the middle of trying to uh, use the crisis intervention training. And many times, uh, basically all it is, is is for the correctional officer or the staff to stop and think for a minute before indulging in the use of force. Sometimes if a person re is refusing to go into a cell, mm, that's, that's a problem, but it's not always that we have to get them in the cell right at that moment. Maybe everybody else is locked in. Mm -hmm. And maybe that individual has a reason that he doesn't want, maybe his cellie told him he was gonna assault him if he came in the cell. But if you don't stop to talk to him, you'll never know that. So the reduction in the population has afforded us with opportunities for, new opportunities for training of staff, um, more space for programming, um, and, and to basically to, to redeploy the staff in a more meaningful way and, and to reduce our vacancies. So how do you compare in deaths while incarcerated from year to year? Is it declining? What's going on with that? It, it is declining when we compare it to the national average per 1,000 of, of uh, residents. One of the things I do want to uh, really put on the table here is staff wellness. And so it's not just about uh, the, the inmate population and all the programs and services that we're providing, but every program that we introduce, there's a staff wellness component to it. Because working in a correctional environment can be challenging to say the least. But when you take into account staff wellness, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we introducing all of these programs? We have one of the challenging jobs in keeping people safe and keeping them properly secured who, if they had an opportunity, they'd be gone and just, you know, walk through the gate. But one of the things is staff wellness, and that's a byproduct of giving the staff the tools to deescalate, to engage the population and that we can coexist. Safety, security, staff wellness, top priorities. And that's how you run an effective, efficient correctional department. When we talk about deaths, we, we are uh, low in comparison to other jurisdictions. We have implemented from lessons learned. Uh, you can't always prevent, but you can intervene. What is it that we need to look for? Um, there's this misconception that you can always recognize someone that wants to commit suicide. Uh -huh. And that's not true. Because people exhibit in very different ways. Some folks you'll see a complete change in their affect where you know if you were uh, a jovial person but now your affect has changed. But then it's the reverse. The person was quiet, all of a sudden they're the happiest person in the world. Those are things that we look to educate staff. And that's why you have to give the correctional uh, uniform staff those tools. So, because they're on those units with those folks and they'll be able to engage. One death is one too many, but you're always on alert 
being uh, aware, looking at changes in individuals, uniform staff, contracted behavior health staff, social service staff, it all has to work in unison to intervene in decreasing uh, suicides in jail. Uh, I would strongly, you know, not definitively say, you are eradicated, no, because we deal with human beings and they're multifaceted, dealing with a myriad of challenges, but it does put us in the best position to offer training so that we further decrease those numbers. One it up, and finally, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll never forget the first budget address of the mayor. When he talked about going to the school up on your facility, the high school, and how the young inmate said to him that he was finally getting geometry, understood the difference between uh, some of the uh, uh, hypothesis, something square that they teach, I forget. Mm -hmm. But he said that was the best school he had ever attended in his life. And it's a sad statement that some of our young people have to wait until uh, they're incarcerated to receive that type of education, but that's the one facility up on State Road I have not been in, and I want to take the opportunity to take a tour maybe this this, this year uh, over the summer if, if it's still open. Invitation stands. Yeah, but does it? Is yes, it open? it's it's it is open. We do have um, that. Penny Pack House School um, graduating. We, we just graduated uh, three young men uh, at PICC. And When's your next graduation? I would have to check for that date, check and me. I'll invite you. Let me know. But I'd like to come up yeah. prior to that just to see how it works. Okay. It was. Uh, it made an impression upon the mayor, and, I, and obviously it made an impression upon the young man that was staying there. So thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman, and thank you all. Thank you thank for what you. you do, okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a little longer break because the fire department, as the police were leaving to go there, the fire department is there now at the Blue Flame. So we're going to break till 2 p.m. We will be back at 2 p.m. Commissioner, thank you. Thank, thank you all you. very much.